Hello, and thank you for joining the Can Atlantic Conference, the country's first mid Atlantic cannabis conference, brought to you by the Philadelphia Association of Black Journalists. Presenting Maryland's State of State Cannabis Report is Olivia Noggle, Policy Legislative Analyst for Marijuana Policy Project, an advocacy organization that's been fighting for cannabis legalization for the last 25 years. Thank you, Olivia, for joining us, and take it away. Awesome. What's up, everyone? Um, and thank you for tuning into the conference today. Um, I'm very excited to be a part of it. And a big thank you to Tahid and everyone who has made this event possible. Um, so my name is Olivia Noggle. I'm a legislative analyst at the Marijuana Policy Project, or MPP. Um, I've been in our state policies department for about two years now, um, where I lead our advocacy efforts in the DMV area, as well as a handful of other states. Um, one of the states that I've been most involved in is Maryland. So today I'm going to talk a bit about Maryland's current cannabis laws, um, as well as the effort moving forward um, to legalize cannabis in Maryland. So I thought I would start with just a snapshot of some of the recent uh, top cannabis headlines in Maryland media uh, that I'll be touching on throughout my presentation. Um, some of the local media outlets in Maryland that cover and tend to pick up um, cannabis policy reform uh, include the Baltimore Sun, uh, Maryland Matters, and the Daily Record, to name a few. Um, and cannabis reform efforts in Maryland, particularly um, State's Attorney Marilyn Mosby's non-prosecution policy, which I'll detail later, um, have received national media attention as well. So to start with Maryland's current cannabis laws, um, I'll start with Maryland's medical cannabis program. Um, so Maryland legalized cannabis in 2014, and on the screen here is um, sort of a timeline of what that rollout has been. Um, so the Maryland Medical Cannabis Commission um, was established as the regulatory agency that oversees uh, Maryland's medical cannabis program and the first dispensaries um, were open to patients in 2017. I will note here um, that unfortunately there was not the level of diversity and minority ownership in the originally licensing and the original licensing of um, medical cannabis businesses. So in 2018, uh, the legislature and governor passed uh, House Bill 2. And that was aimed at increasing the number of minority owned businesses in um, the current medical cannabis industry. Uh, the, bills allow, the bill allows additional uh, grower and processor licenses to be issued. I believe there's four cultivation and 10 processing licenses to be issued. Um, but unfortunately the process has, has long been delayed and we're still waiting um, for those additional licenses to be issued. Um, so, so be on the lookout um, from updates from the commission for that. And hopefully um, in this next round of licensing, um, you know, we can achieve the level of diversity um, and better reflect um, Maryland's uh, population. Um, so now three, almost four years since cannabis sales first began, um, here's a look at where the program is at now. Um, so there are over 100,000 um, certified patients currently in, in Maryland. Uh, those are the, the latest numbers. Um, there's also 70, or sorry, uh, 92 licensed dispensaries throughout the state. Um, and last year, uh, retail sales totaled um, over 200 million, as you can see on the screen there. Um, and I'm sure these numbers will surely continue to grow. <laughs> Um, so I thought it'd be worthwhile to uh, briefly go over the process to become a registered patient and legally obtain uh, medical cannabis in Maryland. Um, and all of this information uh, that you need is going to be on the commission's website. Um, I have it on the screen here. It's mmcc.maryland.gov. Um, so I would encourage folks to go there um, for all of this information and more. Um, but briefly, uh, the statute allows recommendations for medical cannabis uh, for any severe condition uh, that other medical treatments have been ineffective. Um, providers are encouraged to recommend cannabis for um, the condi conditions that you see um, listed on the screen here. 
Um, so what you're going to want to do then um, is number one, register as a patient with the commission. Um, as I said, all that information is available on their website. Um, and then after receiving uh, approval from the commission, you would then need to obtain a written certification from a registered provider. I believe that the commission lists registered providers throughout the state um, and all that information is available as well. And then once you receive your um, patient ID card from the commission, then you would just need to um, visit a Maryland dispensary. And that would be the process. Um, so in this time, I definitely wanted to be sure to include it a little bit um, on, on this bit here. Um, so amid the coronavirus pandemic, uh, when states started issuing stay at home orders and closure of non-essential businesses, um, MPP began tracking the measures that states with uh, medical cannabis programs took to ensure safe access um, to medical cannabis during the pandemic. Uh, and these measures included, um, you know, one, ensuring medical cannabis businesses uh, were deemed essential and could remain open. Um, and also, you know, were delivering curbside pickup uh, made available so that patients and, and medical um, operators in the state could minimize in-person uh, contact and adhere to social distancing guidelines, as well as um, making telehealth available to patients as well. Fortunately, uh, the Medical Cannabis Commission in Maryland provided all of these measures um, to patients and businesses to make sure that patients could access their medicine um, during this time. Um, so to shift away from medical cannabis, uh, Maryland also decriminalized possession of 10 grams or less of cannabis in 2014. So this is the current um, decriminalization law um, in Maryland. Um, so what does that mean? Folks no longer face a criminal penalty for possession of 10 grams or less. Um, instead, possession of 10 grams or less is a um, civil offense similar to um, a traffic ticket. So your first offense is punishable by a $100 fine. Um, second offense is a $250 fine. And then uh, as you can see here, the third and subsequent offenses are a um, $500 fine. Um, as well as mandatory drug education. Um, I would also note here that this is one of the lowest thresholds of any state that has decriminalized or legalized cannabis. Um, most states that have decriminalized or legalized allow for up to an ounce to be possessed, um, and that threshold is even higher in some states. Um, so I just wanted to note that here because that leads us into the next uh, thing that I wanted to hit was um, a bill that was introduced in the 2020 legislative session to actually expand uh, Maryland's decriminalization law. So HB 550 um, would have simply increased the amount decriminalized from 10 grams to an ounce. So it would put Maryland more on par um, with what other states have done. Um, this bill would have further reduced the number of people branded with criminal penalties and all of the collateral consequences um, that come with that for simple cannabis possession. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, this bill passed the House um, in the session, but the General Assembly um, ended their 2020 session early amid the uh, coronavirus pandemic, and the Senate did not take it up before the legislature adjourned. So while unfortunately it didn't make it through the legislative process um, this year, an even better policy uh, would be to end cannabis prohibition altogether and legalize and regulate cannabis for adults. Um, so hopefully the legislature seriously considers uh, legalization in the next session. So um, the Baltimore City non-prosecution policy, this was a big step in cannabis policy reform in Maryland, um, and it was honestly one of the most progressive cannabis policies taken by a prosecutor in the country and certainly picked up by uh, national media coverage. Um, so in late January of 2019, uh, the Baltimore City State's Attorney, Marilyn Mosby, um, announced that her office would no longer prosecute marijuana possession, regardless of the amount or a, of a person's criminal history. Um, data had showed that even post decriminalization in 2014, 
um, that cannabis possession arrests um, had continued in Baltimore City um, and the racial disparities were, were just staggering. So in 2015, 2016, and 2017, there were nearly 1,500 adults arrested for possession. And um, of those arrestees, 96% were black. And what this non-prosecution policy tells us is that this level of law enforcement recognizes that there's, it recognizes the unequal enforcement of our cannabis laws um, and the disproportionate impact that this has on black and brown communities um, and that their resources are better spent on more serious crimes, uh, not prosecuting simple cannabis possession. Um, so with state's attorney, Marilyn Mosby's uh, leadership on this policy, hopefully can help and encourage um, the Maryland General Assembly um, to follow her lead um, and, and, and prohibition altogether. Okay, so expungement. I wanted to touch on this um, a little bit as well. Um, there is an expungement process for past cannabis convictions in Maryland. Um, so the current process um, with the passage of SB 949 in 2014, it reduced the waiting period um, to file a petition for expungement for a marijuana possession offense um, from 10 years to four years. Um, so that's the current process. Um, there was also a reform effort uh, this past session in 2020 um, that I wanted to mention, um, which is HB 83. Um, the bill would automatically shield past cannabis um, convictions. Um, so it's not full record expungement. It would have simply um, shielded, I think it was nearly 200,000 um, past cannabis possession charges from public view on the ju judiciary's uh, case search website. And this bill was approved uh, by both chambers. Um, and sadly, the bill was vetoed by Governor Hogan. And, um, you know, the legislature could override this veto, veto when they reconvene in, in 2021. Um, and with all this being said, uh, while, you know, these modest expungement reforms are, are certainly important, um, again, I have to hone in and say that, uh, you know, hopefully the legislature working with the, the judiciary system in Maryland can develop an automatic expungement process for past cannabis offenses um, if and when the state moves forward with legalization um, so that that process is automatic and at no burden to the, the individual. They won't have to petition to the court or pay any, any related um, fees um, because we know that these um, criminal charges on someone's record, I mean, the collateral consequences can really, really um, derail someone's life, you know? It can, it can uh, hinder access to employment, um, education, and, and many other, other things. So I think this is a really important piece um, to talk about. All right, so we've touched on medical cannabis, uh, decriminalization, as well as some other reforms. Um, but the only way to truly address um, the decades of harm that cannabis prohibition has caused um, is to end prohibition altogether and to legalize and, and regulate cannabis for adults as 10 states have already done. Um, and only through legalization and regulation can we further um, you know, reduce cannabis related arrests and give adults safe legal access to cannabis, um, as well as have the added economic benefits of a new source of revenue for the state um, and jobs. So I'm gonna touch briefly on the legalization effort in Maryland uh, beginning in 2019 and, and what is next to come. So most states that have legalized cannabis have done so through um, a voter approved initiative. Um, Maryland does not have a ballot initiative process. So either the legislature could, could pass it or there could be a, a constitutional amendment which would be referred to the voters um, to approve and then the legislature would have to uh, you know, sort out the implementation details. Um, the, legislative just, the legislature just outright um, passing it is, is a more ideal scenario. So um, beginning early in 2019, um, leaders of the General Assembly, which was former um, President Mike Miller and the late House Speaker Michael Bush, they um, created a legislative work group to study how to best implement the legalization 
of cannabis in um, Maryland. Uh, the group, unfortunately, ultimately came to a consensus that they would not recommend um, legislation to legalize cannabis for adults in um, 2020. Um, so that kind of left us with, um, there was a bill that was introduced this past session um, as there have been in many past sessions to legalize, um, but that bill, uh, you know, didn't make out a committee, committee and, and didn't really go anywhere. So we're really looking forward to um, the next session in 2021 and, um, you know, the legislature could, could seriously consider legalization um, next year. All right, so some of the hurdles faced um, as far as the legalization effort in Maryland, I would say, um, were, this is not so much uh, now, but certainly, um, you know, this past session um, was, of course, the work group status. So as of now, it doesn't look like the, the work group will, will reconvene or hold any additional meetings. Um, when the work group was first formed, um, you know, a lot of people anticipated that they might produce a legalization bill themselves, um, and that, that didn't happen. So um, moving forward, um, it, it doesn't look like, uh, you know, leadership and, and other, and then the work group will meet um, and, and take a hold of this issue. Um, so the next hurdle that I would mention is um, the rollout of the medical cannabis program. And I touched on this a bit um, when I was going over that piece, but, um, you know, not having any diversity in the license holders on the medical side has made a lot of folks um, a little hesitant to move forward with legalization because of that. Um, you know, they want to get medical right first um, and achieve that level of diversity on the medical side before opening up an adult use market. Um, and I like to look at the, the other side of that um, and say that, you know, while there were problems, were and are still problems um, on the medical side uh, when it comes to, you know, diversity and inclusion, um, Maryland is in a unique position to learn from, from that process and from the social, social equity programs of other states to ensure that full minority participation and, and ownership in the legal industry uh, when legalizing cannabis for adult use. And finally, I wanted to conclude uh, with an important piece here, and that's that the majority of Marylanders support legalizing cannabis. Um, so Marylanders, please be sure to reach out to your elected officials um, and let them know that you want them to make legalization a priority in 2021 and, and that this issue matters to you. Um, there will be an effort to legalize cannabis in Maryland in 2021. Um, MPP will be working on this effort we also convene the Maryland Cannabis Policy Coalition, which is a group of organizations with the shared mission of ending cannabis prohibition in Maryland. So I encourage folks who are interested in future updates and, and details on legalization in Maryland to sign up for our email alerts at mpp.org. Um, our email alerts are super informative. Um, an easy, an easy way to get involved. Um, we let folks know when session starts, uh, when bills drop, when committee hearings are scheduled for bills, uh, when we hold our annual lobby day, um, and all the latest statuses on, on cannabis bills um, in the Maryland General Assembly. Um, and we make it super easy for folks to email their lawmakers in support of bills uh, with, with pre-written letters. Um, so please uh, sign up and join us. And with that, I will conclude and say thank you so much again uh, for those who have tuned in and, and to everyone who helped make this event and conference possible. Um, and I look forward to answering any questions that folks may have. Hello. What's up, Tahid? How are Hello. you? Uh, I Listen, we're here. Today is the day. I know. I've, I've tuned in a little bit and it's been awesome. So wow. thanks again for having me. No, thank you for, for sticking with me and, and, and really supporting. This has been such a wild ride. As you know, you've been a part of this. Um, so really appreciate uh, you and, and MPP's support in this conference. Um, so we don't have any questions right now, but, you know, again, if people have questions around Maryland. Um, otherwise, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the future. We're going to talk about the election, obviously. Um, but let's start with the future question. In one year from now, next year for having this conversation, where do you hope Maryland is? 
Yeah, so uh, the first thing, and I touched a bit on it in my presentation, but the first thing I would say is that it's my hope that on the medical cannabis side, um, that the additional licenses that still need to be issued um, are issued and that we see some black ownership in those those licensees and that this round hits the diversity goals um, that it set out to. Um, you know, there's still four cultivation licenses and 10 processing licenses. Um, so again, I would just say to, um, you know, be on the lookout from that news from the Medical Commission. And, um, you know, let, let's hope this finally gets done right. Um, and then, of course, there's the question of, of legalization um, in the next year. Um, and, you know, will Maryland move forward with adult use? Um, there will certainly be a legalization bill introduced in the upcoming 2021 session. Um, mm -hmm. But again, I would say to folks in Maryland um, to be sure to reach out to your lawmakers and let them know that you want them to make this a priority. It's really, really important um, that they hear from their constituents. Um, so I would invite folks to sign up for our email alerts at mpp.org um, to get updates on the legalization effort in 2021. Um, and for more ways to get involved and help us end cannabis prohibition in Maryland. Um, you know, Marijuana Policy Project has celebrated its 25th anniversary, correct? It's, it's, um, it's been around for, for almost three decades now. Um, can you kind of talk to, to people who are watching who may not be uh, as proactively involved in the advocacy or activism space, whether, you know, time constraint, jobs, all that. Why should people advocate? Why should people be part of the, the movement and be active participants, however they can participate? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's something that I like to really, um, you know, underscore for folks. Um, like I said, you know, reaching out to your lawmakers is, is really, really important. At the end of the day, you know, they're there to represent you. So it's really important for you um, to let them know, like, that this issue matters to you. And it really does hold um, a lot of weight um, from for them to, to, for lawmakers to hear from their constituents. Um, I would also say, you know, there's a lot of different ways um, to get involved. Like I said, um, you know, we make it really easy with our email alerts to stay updated and informed, because um, that's also another important piece is just to know what's going on um, in your state and in your region, which is why I'm so excited to be a part of this conference here today. I, I've learned a lot myself. Um, so, yeah, I would say those things um, and just, you know, stay informed, um, you know, think of ways to get involved, contact your lawmakers, you know, write a letter to the editor in, in your local newspaper. Um, there's a lot of ways to get involved out there and it's, it's really important. In terms of the uh, effects of the election, um, you know, what are, what are some of the areas that, you know, in terms of planning, what are you planning for in terms of like outcomes? Yeah, so um, this isn't an election year in, in the Mar for the Maryland General Assembly and governor. So uh, there's not a lot of big changes to look out for on that level this year. Um, but I would say, um, you know, nationally, 2020 could be another big year um, for the cannabis, like the cannabis policy reform movement. Um, mm -hmm. Cannabis is on the ballot in Montana and South Dakota. Um, and MPP is proud to play a leading role in those initiatives. Uh, cannabis is also on the ballot in Arizona, Mississippi, and New Jersey. Um, so the outcomes of those ballot initiatives could result in more states legalizing medical cannabis and a wave of that, right? Yeah. Um, so you know that could really build more momentum both on the state and federal level for for cannabis policy reform. And as we um, as we start to emphasize the fact that like you know New Jersey potentially legalizing, it can cause that domino effect um, to spur other states to do it. And, you know, Pennsylvania is really talking about it. New York has to catch back up with people, but they were moving forward as well. Um, Delaware, I learned Delaware is could have passed it this year, and that would have been really surprising for me. But clearly, you know, I need to learn a little bit more about Delaware. But, you know, it, it seems like we're naturally getting there. Um, how can people prepare themselves, I guess, for legalization if you're uh, a cannabis entrepreneur, if you're someone who wants to get into the ancillary markets, if you're trying to just basically get into a good position to, to ensure that, you know, if you want to build a business, you can thrive, especially um, as, a, as a person of color, how should, how should we be prepared? Um, I would say, again, um, you know, do your research. Um, look at the markets that are, that are existing in other states, you know, um, 
what's working, what isn't working. Um, try to familiarize yourself if you're trying to get into, um, you know, a legal market yourself. Uh, familiarize yourself with the licensing and application processes. Um, and I guess just try to, you know, find someone else uh, that can mentor you or, or might be able to, um, you know, help you out along the way. Um, so, yeah, I would say that. And I'm just double checking the chat to see if we have any questions. We do not have any questions. So with that being said, um, again, thank you so much for your time. Can you give people one more uh, shout out on how they can connect with you or how they can connect with MPP? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, our website is MPP.org. We have a wealth of information on there as it pertains to medical cannabis, uh, decriminalization and adult use, as well as the ballot initiatives that we're working on this, this, coming, this year. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at Marijuana Policy. Um, and also feel free to, to reach out to me directly if you have questions on uh, Maryland. I also work on um, you know, our advocacy efforts in the DMV area and as well as a handful of other states. Uh, you can reach me by email at onoggle at mpp.org. Um, and I would be happy to um, answer any questions or just chat all things cannabis policy. And for those who are viewing this uh, session, um, the Maryland Caucus and networking lounge is open. It's popping in there. There's a lot of people talking, so that's great. Uh, there's a lot of activity. So Olivia, if you're able to spend a few more minutes, um, hopefully people will see you there. Otherwise they can connect with you uh, outside of the conference as well. Um, thank you again for your time. Really appreciate it. Awesome, I look forward to it. Thank you so much for having me again. Um, it's been awesome, so take care. <laughs> take care.